Welcome to the first episode of Baffling Cyclops. I'm David Wall, and in this podcast, Pepper and I will cover topics we're obsessed with. This week's topic came up because we have been watching the documentary series The Vow on HBO. It's a harrowing account of what happened in the Nexium cult. Thinking about cults led us to talk about Mick Jagger and elves, because of course it did. So this week, I we watched the um, Nexium documentary. Yes. And as part of the Nexium documentary, they made the people who joined the cult kiss the cult leader <laughs> before they joined the cult, right? Yes. And it bothered you? It did. And we both said, not the cult for us. No. Because you basically would kiss the leader, cult leader on the lips... Well, you would have to kiss him on the lips, and then you'd have to go watch him play volleyball, like, from 10 o'clock at night until, like, 7 in the morning, and he kind of held court. Right. But he also wore, like, a sweatband and knee pads, and there's nothing wrong with that, except when you're, like, a cult leader, it's real weird. <laughs> it's real weird. So, I, I, I was thinking back this week. To a time in my life when I did something that I was uncomfortable with uh, to join something. Oh, well, tell me about it. And what what I was remembering was when um, I went to uh, interview at the toy store down in Pioneer Square. We'll avoid saying the uh, name. Yeah. Talk it, about cult leader. <laughs> one of the things I had to do was... Um, talk to a gorilla and have a whole conversation with uh, Gilbert the stuffed gorilla. Was that before? Yeah, that was before you um, got into improv. Yes. Was it your first foray into improv? <laughs> I think you and I had improv before that. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do it. But um, and that. <laughs> but you. So as part of the interview, I met him at a Starbucks. I met uh, one of the owners at a Starbucks, and. Um, then I guess I passed that part of the interview. And so I had to go over to the store and she introduced me to Gilbert the gorilla. And I had to, um, shake the gorilla, stuffed gorilla's hand. How big was the gorilla? I can't remember. It was the size of a, a husky baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody that would go to Gap Plus, baby. <laughs> like it was a big I baby. I don't know if... Gap Baby has a husky. I think Sears is Sears okay. maybe had yeah. husky sizes. It's, I'm not it's sure. Would have been Gap Sears, Baby did <laughs> Sears Husky Baby in 1976. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, but it was a it was a gorilla, and you'd shake its hand. And then um, I have since learned from other people, um, and just on Twitter, uh, Bad Robot Robot told me he knows someone who actually had to go for a walk, and talk to Gilbert for the whole walk while both he and the owner held one hand of the gorilla down the street. But didn't it, you're not supposed to do that with a husky baby because it can pull their right. arms out of right. their little like <laughs> sockets. Husky sockets. Yeah. So they had to w- go for a walk down the street holding the gorilla to get a job at the toy store. Okay. And um I I was thinking about um the most famous person that I served while I was working there. Oh, yeah. There. Tell us. Okay. So <laughs> how long did you work at that place? I worked there for about three and a half months. Okay. And so you had a lot of tourists come in then? A lot of tourists. Um, and uh, the first famous person that I waited on, not the most famous, yeah. but the first famous person I waited on was Harry Anderson from uh, Night Court. He was a magician, right? Yeah. He played the judge or? He played the judge on Night Court, and he was taller than I was. That was back in the, Night Court was on in the 70s or the 80s? 80s. It was an 80s show. And you're 6'5". I'm 6'5". Okay. So he was taller than I was. So he had a presence. He had a presence. And um, the owner of the store, the male owner of the store, had... You have to, you, you mean the master? Of the store? <laughs> I was the guru of the store. Okay. So he he um, had ordered um, a Marklin Z-scale train in a suitcase. Um, a Marklin trains are, it was a, this old German brand of tra- okay. train, and they made the smallest one, so small that you could put it in a suitcase 
and carry it around. And then I guess when you're on the a train, open the suitcase, and then the train had a little electric charge in it, and it could go around, and you had like a mountain and everything inside the oh, suitcase. Oh, that sounds cool. So it's or not a briefcase. I should say more than it's suitcase. It's not like an O scale or Z, A show. It's Z. like teeny. Okay. Z, they went. They That's went, cool. They went all the way to Z. Okay. Just to okay. say, like, you're not going to make so a train smaller. So you could smaller. play with the train while you rode the train. I guess. Okay. I, okay. I don't know. That because So he bought it without asking Harry Anderson if he wanted that. He just knew that Harry Anderson liked trains. Oh, wait. So Harry trains. Anderson b- didn't buy it. Um, the didn't master it. of the store purchased this wholesale to resell to Harry Anderson Correct. from Night Court. Okay. And he didn't want it. So every time yeah. Harry, Harry Anderson came in to get some train supplies, the the male leader of the store would come out. Would, we can call him master. Master, <laughs> master would come out, and he wouldn't he wouldn't let anyone else talk to Harry Anderson because he had to every time he came in he would have to hard sell Harry Anderson on this oh my suitcase train. And all I remember is like being excited to see Harry Anderson because yeah. he was very funny on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. He used to do like a really great stand-up routine. He's, he's since passed away, but he did a, yeah. he did this amazing routine. He always did like con jobs. He was kind of in the Penn and Teller vein when it came to okay. the, you know, he okay. was a little bit more edgy and, and, um, the but, only thing I remember from night court is, um, the, one of the, the female who I think her name is Marky Post. Mm-hmm. She had the most amazing, Insanely feathered hair. She, it was crazy. It was magical. Magical. Okay, so, continue. <laughs> so all I remember is he he went through this hard sell. He bought the train pieces that he wanted. Well, who who bought them? The master or Harry Anderson? Harry Anderson went through the hard sell. Okay. Did, oh, oh, and then okay. bought what okay. he wanted, and okay. he turned around and he was leaving the store. Okay. And he said. I don't want a goddamn train in a suitcase. What the fuck would I do with a train in a suitcase? <laughs> so I thought that was great. Also, while I was did he there, ever come back, or was he just done with you? Well, guys? No, I mean he he came there for train supplies. Was he in? Did he live in Seattle? Yeah. Oh, okay. Around okay. Seattle. Okay. Like, I don't think he lived in Seattle. Seattle so area. he was okay. So he, but he would come in occasionally. But I, I only only once while I was there. But he came in because he was built train sets. And, yeah. and they, we were the only ones that had this particular brand yeah. of train yeah. in town. So he would come in. The other one that came in while I was there was the guy that played uh, Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. But I didn't meet him. I just saw the oh, back of his head. I like that actor. Yeah. And <laughs> then... Well, who's the, who is the most famous? So the most famous, and I just reposted this on my blog because I wrote it up before. The most famous person was Mick Jagger. What? Yeah. And let me tell you, um, I was young at this point. This was 1994. You were still a baby. So I was a baby. I was... You weren't even legal yet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, wait. Hang on a second. Just just so you... Just backpedal. The guy who played Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs, his name was Ted Levine. And the character was... His name was um, James Gum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, wow, Mick Jagger. So Mick Jagger came in, and I have to say, that I was not that impressed. Really? With Mick Jagger. No, I was like. Oh, I totally would have been. You know, my parents did not listen to the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. Um, I had maybe heard um, like the Rolling Stones best of CD or tape or whatever it was at the oh. time. But I wasn't like an aficionado of the Rolling Stones. So to me, like it would have been if Frank Black had come in. Yeah. I would have been like, oh yeah. my God. Or, or yeah. Robert Pollard. You know yeah. what I mean? I'd have been like Robert from Pollard. Guided by voices. voices. Yeah. yeah. One of those guys. And Frank in. Black from the Pixies. Right. If I had come in, I'd have been like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they're here. But with Mick Jagger, like everyone else was like hiding. Like everyone that worked there was like literally left. Like the manager had to leave the room. Because they were so intimidated because Mick Jagger was there. Because they were so intimidated and Mick Jagger and I was like, I'll wait on him. Like, I don't care. So I went up. I'm like, hey, I'm I'm David. If you need any help while you're here, just ask. And then I, I don't know how to exactly say this. He made a grunting noise. And then with his, <laughs> his face, he just made expressions that indicated like I should stand off to the side and wait. 
Uh, okay. He and, does have an expressive face. Yes. <laughs> and I actually, when I wrote this uh, in the essay, uh, Philip Treese wrote back and said, he gets that all the time because he's English. Uh-huh. And in his, he said in his day do- job, 90% of the feedback he gets is minute facial expressions. <laughs> So I was like, and Philip Trace is um, a magician. Well, he's a magic expert. He's an expert at magic, and he has a couple books too, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, uh, so Mick Jagger, like indicated I should stand off to the side and wait. So then you're very intuitive. (laughs) <laughs> I guess I'm just I'm not that intuitive, which is why I was like, it must have been good facial expressions. Yeah. I think I think it's like he, he pointed with his lip to where I should stand. <laughs> so so I I am um, I set off to the side, and it was he was really odd because he just he was making a pile of stuff in the middle of the room. Like, Wait, how was he making a pile? Like he was like like he would be looking at say. Um, a set of blocks. Okay. And he would pick it up and he would take it to a central location of the room and set it on the floor. In the store. In the store. And he would just set it on okay. the floor. So then he but, would... So you, and you're just standing there the whole and time. And I'm standing there the whole time. And then he left that particular room. Because I have to say... Because uh, that store, I mean, it was multi-levels, multi-rooms, it is, tons of trains in a suitcase. Only one train in a suitcase. But. It's a labyrinth. Yeah. That store is a labyrinth. I, I'll go into it in a second. Let me just okay. finish this part, though. Because he... So I started putting this stuff back. Because oh. kids do that. But then I realized halfway through putting it back, I'm supposed to take this up to the cash register because okay. he wants to buy it. But literally had no concept because the whole job at that th- at a toy store is kids pick stuff up and put it on the floor. You pick it off the yeah, floor. You put it back on the it. shelf. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so I guess I was I was saying in my head, Mick Jagger was like a four year old. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't think you're the only one who maybe has thought that. <laughs> so in, in but this store is crazy. I, I don't yeah. know because it's like uh, well it, how how so tell us about so that. as you said two floors um, but it's almost like um, uh, they had taken like rooms in an old rooming house and turned it into a store uh, there were multiple doorways mm-hmm. into every room you could get lost um, it. Uh, it extended out under the street because it was part of the Seattle underground. Oh, because of the fire. It was one of the first buildings that was rebuilt after the fire. Right. So, so the toy store, the basement of the toy store used to be the first level on the street. On first, it's first. uh, Yeah. Yeah. And then, and right in Pioneer Square there. And then after the fire, they built it up. So the second floor of the building became the first floor of the building. Okay. So, you could lit where the puzzles were in this place. Yeah, was where the opening to the building used to be. It was out under the street. There was the sidewalk actually had glass cubes. Those purple in it. glass cubes still does. Right, so, so you the could, light would go through. And there was storage that extended out even further. Okay, so you were in like part of the store is in the bowels of. It's in the bowels, and okay. and like it's very you can easily get lost yeah. there, as I said, and. Um, I don't know if I've ever told you this exactly. I probably did at the time, but um, we always thought that there were holes in the walls because uh, the male owner of the store, you would be doing something like talking to Harry Anderson and he would just appear like out of nowhere. And there were so many doors and weird like places and he had keys to all the doors in the building. So he could get everywhere like super quickly in this yeah. really old building, and um, there is a reason why I call him the master. I know. <laughs> I don't want to get sued, so. <laughs> but so he um, he uh, he would just appear. So you'd be like doing something, and then all of a sudden, dude. And we know it wasn't cameras because right. well, it's also in the early nineties. Was in the early nineties. Yeah. We knew it wasn't cameras because. Um, they didn't know stuff went on at night. Do you know what I mean? Like they had an alarm system. Right. Because um, right before I left, I found out one of the other employees had been sleeping in the book room in the basement uh, at night. Yeah, one of the slaves. Yeah, elves. I'm sorry, elves. Did you know that? I didn't even say that. We were called elves. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I was I was a six foot five elf. I was dressed. Did you have to wear the outfit? I wore a tiny green apron, <laughs> just like David Sedaris. Everyone always says, just like David Sedaris, and I'm like, yes, just like David Sedaris, except I didn't have to wear ears or a hat. Well, you know, I have my own elf story, but that's better for another time. <laughs> exactly. Maybe yeah. I couldn't do it. We tell your story too. Well, I want to hear the rest of your. Well, I want to hear more about so, Mick Jagger. So the. Um, we're we're going through and I'm picking up all of his stuff and putting it up at the cash wrap and um you know one of the the manager has come out and he's standing there at the cash wrap. Yeah. Not the owner, but the yeah. manager is there. And the one thing I'll say while Mick Jagger is shopping is middle aged ladies kept coming up to him and they would say what sexual act they had experienced while listening to the <laughs> oh Rolling gosh. Stones, oh and my then gosh. say they because poor Mick and the female owner of the store, the one who had taken me to meet Gilbert, came up and she was like, "Oh, I lost my virginity to and I can't remember the song, but like Jumpin' Jack Flash." <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I can't. Help. Oh, that's so, not the song to lose your virginity. <laughs> Oh Let's, okay, you can't always get what you want. Wait, no, that's bad too. I can't get no satisfaction. No, 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 no. Oh my god. <laughs> so, so, but, uh, but it happened over and over again. Okay. Where, like people were just approaching women, him. Okay. Not like dudes weren't coming yeah. up and going, "Hey, man, yeah. I lost my virginity to yeah. Jumba Jack Flash." <laughs> 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 oh my god. The owner was just her heart was a flutter. Okay. A flutter. And the male owner wasn't there at that time, but um, he was hanging. He was hiding in the walls. Something. Okay. <laughs> uh, pe- peeping <laughs> through the, what we assumed were holes. <laughs> the master. <laughs> so we um, we're um, we're t- walking through the store, and he's not talking to me. And he had like. A nanny there, or some somebody was kid, involved. He did, had no did he kids have a, there. He didn't have his kids. He, I think with, okay. he was Christmas shopping because oh, it was okay. it was like yeah. December fourteenth okay. or thirteenth. I looked okay. up to see when they came yeah. through Seattle just to do it. And so the, he was doing Christmas so shopping. So were the Rolling Stones performing in Seattle? Yeah, okay, at the Key okay. Arena. Okay, okay. Unbeknownst to me, yeah, down the street from where we used to live. Yeah, a Voodoo Lounge tour. Okay. Uh, someone looked it up and told okay. me. So the okay. Voodoo Lounge tour. So, and I remember um, at the time they were saying that the uh, the Rolling Stones uh, were too old to rock and roll back in 1994. Oh my gosh, that's really funny because they we took our nephew <laughs> to his first to concert. his very first concert in Ohio, and it was the Rolling Stones years, yeah, like and years four years ago, yeah, yeah, later. Yeah. Um, I think it was maybe like maybe five or six years. And um, so they were still touring yeah. then. Right. But they were too old in 1994. I remember they the Seattle Times had an article that was like, get out the Geritol. <laughs> the Rolling Stones are here. And then we here. saw them 20 years yeah. later <laughs> but, with, with the opening act of... Kid Rock. Whoa. With, okay. Who brought out the guy that killed Osama bin Laden. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that was something. Who, who's okay. been banned from flying on planes now. So Okay, so let's talk more about Mick and so, his pile. So, so then um, I'm just following him around and I'm watching all the ladies. But we go into the book room and they, I have to say, they did such a good job buying for that store. And it is still a great store. Yeah. Like if you go into that store, like you'll have a great time. Yeah. You should actually go into that store. It's amazing. Um, if nothing else, than to shop in the puzzle room so you can say you were under the streets yeah. of Seattle. Yeah. But um, they they do j- amazing job buying for that store. They have a great stuff. So the book room is was like whatever was hot at the time with like a really good mix of classics, mm-hmm. a whole case full of tarot decks, games. Like it was a beautiful room. And Mick Jagger, the only time I saw him get excited was when he saw the Magic Eye books. Oh, those. Okay, so the Magic Eye books from the or 90s. The, yes. <laughs> those were the books um, that or they were images and they were compiled into a book that if you just looked at it, you couldn't see any image. But, but then it was if like you like colorful static. Yeah, almost. if you like squinted your eyes and then crossed them and then. Put your you nose on it, and then, right. and then you could see images like yeah. hidden within. And he it. was like, 
so oh thrilled. My God. Did and he he's jump, like, wait, did he jump in Jack Flash? <laughs> he <did. laughs> I don't know. So he was so excited. And then he's like, is this the latest one? And I said, yes, because okay. we just we yeah. got it in like during the time that I worked there. So I was like, yeah, that's the latest one. And he's like, don't you just love these? And I had to admit to him, I couldn't see him. I you couldn't not, see the images. I couldn't see the images. Oh, no. And so um, he said, come here. So, <laughs> and I can't do an imitation. Oh. So he held the book up and he's like, now unfocus your eyes. Oh, and my And then gosh. he held the book and like oh. did it until I saw a unicorn. <gasps> oh, my God. That's awesome. And I was like, ah, oh, I see a unicorn. And he's like. Yep, you got it. And then he closed the book and he stopped talking to me again. Oh my god, can, wait, can't you do it in his voice? I cannot. I can't. Unfortunately, I wish I could. All you have to say is, I bet you'll penny on it and you'll fall into the accent. Just, I know, you have that key phrase that lets you zero in on I it. I bet you'll penny I would, on I, it. Like if, uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon does a really good... Uh, Mick imp- Jagger, yeah. Yeah, Mick Jagger. I, he could probably do it. And you go, yeah, man. <laughs> So then, um, that that I, seemed more like a Beatles. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. I've listened to the Beatles way more than yeah, I, I know. Have. I know. So, <laughs> but um, that was so cool. So he taught Mick Jagger taught me how to see magic eyes because I had never seen one before. Oh my gosh, then. that's awesome! And then um, just and I uh, to continue the story, even though that's the main point of yeah, the story, yeah. is that that my big memory is that Mick Jagger had like an actual human moment with me where yeah. he taught me how to see the magic eye was then, um, he went to, uh, we went to check out. Okay. At, up at the cash wrap. His pile has now been Piles. moved. Okay. But his nanny, I don't know for sure it was his nanny, but her partner, or somebody, or something. it was somebody yeah. who had more to do with the kids than yeah. he did. And he did not want any of her stuff on his bill. So they had to separate it. And I had been carrying his stuff up and she had been putting her own stuff in the car. Uh-huh. And I was just like, oh man, I, I don't must know. Have, and wow. I'm like, I can't keep track of this. And finally, like he walked away while I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she looked at me and she just said, just memorize it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, how do you memorize something that already happened? Like it's already yeah. there. It's not like, I'm like, uh, I guess it was, it was advice for future selling. That if oh it ever happened, gosh. I should memorize. When Did either one of them try to pull Gilbert down from his? <laughs> no. But but the checking him out, he looked at every single item, looked at every item on the cash register, mm-hmm. compared prices, went over the receipt afterwards, wrote a check. It was like almost a thousand dollars. Which uh, was a lot back in the early right. nineties on and, toys. A check too. Yeah. Like he wrote the check. And um, she did they cash it? Th- that's the whole thing. The owner was like, "I'm never cashing this yeah. check." She said, "I'm just never." Well, he's so it. smart. Well, back in the day, I think if you were that fan, I mean, Mick Jagger, come on, yeah, super famous, right? That's smart. A smart way to get free stuff because <laughs> you write a check and you have a, like probably eighty percent odds that some middle aged. Um, woman lost who lost her virginity to jumping Jack Flash is not going to cash your check <laughs> and want to keep it forever. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my my Mick Jagger story. And he left, and um, then everyone was uh, pretending they were the one that had served Mick Jagger. Oh and I was my like, gosh. Whatever, but so and then you wrote a story about it. Yeah, I wrote a story about it. I put it up on my blog, mostly just about the magic eye part. If somebody wants to read it, where can they read it? Uh, CreativeCreativity.com. Oh, awesome! Cool. Yeah, so I put it up, um, and uh, that was a that was a strange a strange scene. Do you want to tell your elf story? Um, I can. I want you to tell your okay. elf story. I should say. So um, my elf story. I worked at a very large downtown department store, and I worked, I don't want to say where, um, but it was like multi, it was like, I don't know, eight, seven stories. Um, It was like the flagship store. It was like, are you being served? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, and, and I love department stores. Yeah. Like it's, I still love them. I'm so sorry to see them kind of falling away, but. 
So, and I also worked in the display department, the visual merchandising um, display department. Um, and we were called trimmers back then because we like put any kind of display. We did the windows, right. we did all that. Um, and we made not very much money. <laughs> it's an hourly yeah. position. The first thing that got trimmed yeah. was your paycheck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And minimum wage, I think back then was, you know, not very much. No. So, you know, I was trying to have, I had a side hustle back then. You did. I, huh. I sure did. I was, I was in may, maybe my late teens, early twenties. And one of the side hustles, um, that we, the display department were asked to do, would be um, dress up as characters um, for, for Santa Land. for different things. Like we not only designed and made this giant Santa Land that you could walk through with like little and a, animatronic and a train, right? Oh yeah, we had a train. Um, my best friend like ma- like built the train from like plywood. It was it looked great though. Um, so. We not only made Santa Land with fake snow, like it was a whole thing. Um, if I told you the, the the store, I think people who people would have memories of this whole thing. Yeah. Um, but they also had like we also had like characters. Um, I at one point I was Willoughby Weebok, which was um, the character for Reebok tennis shoes, but for their children, like the babies. So Weebok. Weebok. Willoughby Weebok. And it was this giant furry costume wearing a a diaper. (laughs) So would you say say it was husky? (laughs) Maybe a little husky. Husky baby. The other one was... um, Husky Willoughby. (laughs) It was Hush Puppy because back... It was even before your story, before we moved to Seattle. Um... Hush Puppies, it was a brand of shoes. Oh, yeah. And it went through this resurgence in the 90, early 90s, but um, Hush Puppies. So I was Hush Puppy, which was like this... We wore that like full costume. It was what are those costumes called? Like just character costumes, like Char- a, like a, almost like you were um, uh, uh, a furry. Yeah, yeah. Wait, whoa! I know. Will I, it be Weebok well, kind of was like a furry because it had a. It was, wearing a, it was a diaper. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. And I can't costumes, believe I married the hush puppy. I know. You married, well, the, the gig was great because we. It was twenty dollars an hour. <sighs> Those that was sweet. That dough was back then. like now it should be minimum wage, but back then it was like I could do a side hustle and pay my rent for the month. Like, right. Yeah. So, but the bad thing about this the, those costumes, those two co- costumes in particular, was you could only wear them for like maybe at the max an hour at a time. Right. So you'd have to trade them off. And so I traded off my Willoughby Weebok with a woman that I was in the display department. Her name was Kathy Citro. She was an amazing woman. Um, but we both were very, it got really hot. So imagine like putting on a fur costume that was drenched oh. with somebody else's sweat. Oh. We both did it because we were like making that big, big dough. Oh, yeah. But um, my so, elf, so it was like a clammy costume, is what you're oh, saying. Oh, it was moist. <laughs> it was it, that diaper was wet. <laughs> <laughs> it needed to be changed. <laughs> my diaper needed to be changed. Um, but so the, one of the side hustles was for the department store. Those were for um, vendors that would want us yeah. to work. Um, I also sprayed perfume. I know bad news, but you know, 20 bucks an hour. Yeah, what you were can like you a do? perfume model. I was a perfume model. Um, but, um, and I probably could have gotten a lot of dates as a perfume model. Just telling you guys, like, I know everybody says those perfume models were irritating, which we really were, but man, some of those guys could be pretty creepy. Um, <laughs> and, but anyway, so the department store had this giant nutcracker <laughs> costume 
And my best friend was asked to be the nutcracker. And he's probably, I don't know, 5'10", 5'11". But you had to wear the nutcracker, the entire head of the nutcracker sat on your shoulders and the nut, the actual nutcracker was over seven feet tall. So where the nutcracker's mouth was, was where he could see mm-hmm. and he couldn't see really well and he couldn't navigate the escalators. Again, seven floors. Yes. So he needed an assistant and the assistant was the elf. Like the Santa Land elf. So there was a costume for me to be his assistant as an elf, which was green tights, a little green leotard, and like a little elf skirt. (laughs) And at that time in my life, I was probably like, I don't know, like a size, a vintage size four. So I was pretty small, except... Um, my bus size at that time Your bosom? was, yeah, I was probably like a 34 G <laughs> maybe I was actually like, I was a 34 triple D, but they were kind of spilling out a little bit. So I put, <laughs> I had my elf costume on and I, and I, we both got dressed in, um, it wasn't the district manager's office, but it was one of the manager's yeah. office and um, you know, I helped him get into his costume and, and we didn't put the hat on yet because he couldn't get out the door. And then I put <laughs> my elf costume and I was fired. I was fired because my boobs were too big. <laughs> they didn't want children to see you. <laughs> no, no, because it was just like nobody was paying any never mind to the nutcracker. All they were doing <laughs> was looking at the nutcracker's they, elf. They weren't looking at the nutcracker. They were looking at the nuts. <laughs> Not the nuts, maybe. The, the nutcrackers. I don't know. So the crackers. <laughs> I lost, I lost my, my gig as a Santa Land elf because my boobs were too big. You were fired as an yeah. elf. Yeah. And then I was hired as an elf. <laughs> it's full circle. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. And to read our show notes, sign up for our newsletter at bafflingcyclops.com.